Well, if you want to find your place in the Word of God, we are in Daniel chapter 3 this morning. Daniel chapter 3. We're going to look at the second half of this chapter, uh, verses 16 through 30. And the title of the message is Standing Amid Hostility. Standing Amid Hostility. I'm going to quote someone, and I would like to see if anyone can tell me who said this, all right? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jim Elliott. Elliott. Very good. Absolutely right. Jim Elliott grew up in Portland, Oregon. And at the age of 29, in January of 1956, Jim and his four missionary friends landed on a remote jungle beach in Ecuador. Their goal was to reach the Aka people with the gospel. Jim and his missionary friend, Pete Fleming, had spent the previous three years in a nearby village of the uh, people of Shandia uh, sharing the gospel. They saw many souls saved there in the jungle. But the people of Shandia were afraid of the Akas because the Aka people were known to be hostile to outsiders. They had killed uh, many of the people of Shandia as well. Well, Jim and Pete knew that the only way to truly help the hostile Akas was to share the gospel message with them, the message of Jesus Christ, the love of our Savior. And so after months of preparation and, and help with by um, their friend Nate Saint as he would fly over that area, they would drop down gifts to the Akas and they would use a loudspeaker to, to call out the few phrases they knew in the Aka language uh, of greeting and so forth. They finally made their first encounter with a few of the Aka people. And at first it seemed positive. Uh, It seemed beneficial. And so they decided that it was time to truly uh, try to reach these people. And so there, January 1956, both uh, uh, Jim and Pete, along with uh, three other friends, missionary friends, landed on that beach near the Aka people, waiting to make contact Well, they made contact with a few of the villagers there, and at first, again, it seemed positive. But after six more days of waiting and a lot of quiet, some Aka warriors came to the beach and killed all five missionaries. There's Ed McCauley, Roger Uteran, Nate Saint, Pete Fleming, and Jim Elliott. But don't think that the deaths of these men were in vain. Because, in fact, in less than two years, Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth Elliott, along with their young daughter and Nate Saint's sister, Rachel, they were able, those ladies were able to move in and live among the Aka people and continue to then share the gospel with them. And many in that village became saved and it became a peaceful tribe due in part to the courage, the love, the testimony of those five men who willingly risked their lives and then died for the sake of the gospel. They had not feared what man could do to them. Instead, they feared God. They served him faithfully to the end. And as we continue our series here in Daniel this morning, the, uh, the title of our series is Living as Faithful Exiles in a Godless World, Daniel 1 through 6. We come to this passage in Daniel 3, and we're going to look at examples of steadfastness, standing firm for the faith in a hostile world. You and I, We do not know what we are going to be called to face as followers of Jesus in our lifetime. We may or may not be called to face death for our faith, but we do know that we will face some hostility, we'll face some opposition for our faith and for our stand for the Lord. So knowing this from our passage, we're going to be encouraged to simply stand in this godless world. We must resolve to stand in this godless world. That's our focus this morning. And as we look at this passage, we're going to three, see three points that will help us face that hostility in a God-honoring way. First, we must stand firm. All right, That's what we're going to see first from this, our example, that we must stand firm. Second, we're going to see that we should expect hostility. Expect hostility. And then third, watch God work. 
Watch God work. So let's talk about standing firm first from verses 16 through 18. So last week we left these three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, standing before a furious king. In fact, the, ba- the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar is his name. He had set up a gold image there in the plains in the province of Babylon. And this gold image was 90 feet tall. And he had called all the leaders of his kingdom to come to worship this image, this false god. Not only would this be a display of unity among his people, but it was a call to submission and service to Nebuchadnezzar, the one who had set up this idol. Well, when all the crowd had gathered, the instructions were given to the crowd that they were to, as soon as the magicians played, uh, musicians played, magicians said the wrong one, not them. As soon as the musicians played, the, the music, the orchestra would play, they were to fall down and worship the golden image. Well, to force compliance, Nebuchadnezzar also had off the side a furnace and it was stoked with fire And if any would not obey his call, they would immediately be thrown into the fire to perish. Well, the orchestra plays, the music begins, and the whole company of people fall on their face before this idol. All but three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These were captives of Judah. And Nebuchadnezzar had brought them to Babylon and taught them the ways of Babylon so that they would be in prominent places and positions in his kingdom. In fact, we had looked at Daniel chapter 1 and 2 and we had seen God's blessing on these men's life along with Daniel and how God had allowed them to remain faithful for their faith and for him and his testimony in this pagan nation of Babylon. But here's another test of faith for these three men. Now, I know there's a question, where was Daniel all in all of this? The simple answer is we just don't know. All right, the Bible doesn't tell us where Daniel is at this particular po- point, but most likely he was at higher rank than the three men. He was probably simply left back in the city of Babylon to watch over affairs as all the other leaders went out to worship this idol. Uh, we don't know why, but we can be quite confident that Daniel was not there. We see a stand for the faith all throughout the book, and uh, here we see that he's just not there on the plains there Um, called to worship, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, and so the spotlight falls on them and the test of their faith here. So when all others around them bow, they stand. They remained faithful. And how was their faithfulness rewarded? It was rewarded with hostility. Others came and said, hey, wait a second, they're standing. They're not even Babylonian by birth, and so they go before the king and say, king, Remember your decree? Just said it a few minutes ago. Anyone who does not worship must be killed. Well, there's three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so the king is furious and he calls to have these three come before him. And so that's where we left them last week. And we're waiting to hear their reply as they stand before the king. Because the king's even willing to give them a second chance, we see. He says, hey, I'll let the orchestra play again. You can bow. But hear their words. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, and they said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They stood boldly for their faith and for the true God. As God's children, we are called to the steadfast faith. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. When we stand firm for the faith, for righteousness, for true worship, that labor is not in vain. That testimony is not in vain. So we must ask the question, what should our steadfastness look like? Well, we can learn a few things from these three men and their reply. And the first is simply that our steadfastness in it, we must be bold. 
All right? There must be a boldness. Uh, look at the boldness of these three men. Here they are. They're standing before the king of Babylon. But this isn't just the king of Babylon. This is the king of, really, the known powerful world. He also has at his disposal any whim. He can take a life or save a life, right? He doesn't have to go through a judicial process here either. He's also known for his hot temper and his quick anger, and he is furious. But they simply say when the king confronts them, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Now, they may have simply said this as, as a way of saying, you know what, we don't really have a defense, right? He's questioning them. Is this really what you're doing? They're like, yes. You know, we don't have a defense. We're guilty as charged. But we also see communicated here that they say there's, there's really no necessity for us to explain ourselves. We don't have to give an excuse for our behavior. And I re- the reason why they didn't have to give an excuse was because Nebuchadnezzar, or even explain it, had already seen God work, Right? He had already seen God work. We look back at Daniel chapter 2, and and God had given Nebuchadnezzar a dream that he didn't know the interpretation to, and and by his his power, he gave Daniel that same dream along with his interpretation, and that had come through the prayer of Daniel and his three friends. And we read uh, then at the end of Daniel 2, where after Nebuchadnezzar sees God, God revealed this mystery. He says of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel's God, he says this, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. He had seen God work. And so here, these three men, they don't, they don't have to explain brand new to this foreign king who God is. They're like, we don't, we don't have to answer. You, you know this. You know who God is. So these men boldly stand. They're bold in their witness. See, the believers in the early church also prayed for boldness in faith and in gospel witness. If you remember, after the religious leaders of their time had threatened and ordered the apostles and by extension God's people to not proclaim the gospel, they go back together and ask for, 429, we hear their prayer and they pray this, Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue what? To speak your word with all boldness. And Paul asks for that same prayer in Ephesians 6.19. He says, Also for me, pray for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Too often we as God's people neglect to share truth about God and the gospel because we're afraid. Or we don't want to rock the boat. Now, indeed, we're, we're called to be wise. We're, we're not called to be needlessly contentious. But we are to speak the truth in love and in gentleness. And we're even called to give a, a sharp rebuke at times, but still in a gracious way. And however, you know, many times we are tempted, though, to just not speak at all, Right? I just won't say anything. I'm not going to stand for the faith. So here we learn from these men's example, don't don't fear what man can do. Instead, be bold. Stand firm. Be bold. Give a clear message. And in our steadfastness, we also learn that not only should we be bold, but we can trust God, right? Why were they bold? Why were these three men bold? Well, here's the foundation for our standing firm. Look again at these men's faith. In verse 17, they said, if this be so, okay? He's, they're answering the king and says, if this be so, if we are going to be thrown in the fiery furnace, our God whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So in boldness, what do they do? They proclaim again truth about God. Even if Nebuchadnezzar didn't believe their word, his belief or his lack thereof, it didn't change the character of God, so they boldly proclaim this truth, And they stand firm when this opposition comes because God is God, right? Who are they relying on? Not their own wisdom, not their own tact, not their own excuses. They rely on God. And he says, you know, and they say, you know what, O king, 
God is able to deliver us. If you look back, what was Nebuchadnezzar's retort, a really challenge in verse 15. He said, I'll, you know, I'll cast you into the fiery furnace. And he said, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands, right? And they say, our God can deliver us. Our God will deliver us. See, our confidence is not in ourself. It's not in our own abilities. It's not in our strength, but it is in the faithfulness of God. We do not fear because God will deliver. Now, these three men understood that God was able to deliver, deliver them out of Nebuchadnezzar's hand, but these men also understood that God's form of deliverance, that was up to God. It might be, they say, that God will deliver us out of the fire, but it also might be that God will allow us to be burned. But no, O king, you're still not the one in control. And no, O king, that God will still deliver us. If we die, we're still going to go to the presence of our Lord. He's still going to bring us safely home. In fact, he just might save us from your hand by taking us home through the fire. But the point here was Nebuchadnezzar, he was not in control. Even his authority, his position, they were given to him by God. And his choices had no power over God's plan for his people. So you and I, when we face hostility in a world that is opposed to God, we can stand firm because God is the author of our lives. He's the author of the length of our days, and he's going to bring us safely to his side. Even if the path is through the darkness, the shadow of the valley of death, dying for our faith, that death will only be the doorway to his presence. We can trust him. We also learn not only that we can be bold and that we should trust the Lord, but in our steadfastness, in our standing firm, we must give a suitable answer. We we have talked about boldness, but here we look at the content of their speech. Here are these three men, they glorify God, don't they? They point all the attention back to God, and they clearly proclaim God's faithful character and his power. They give this suitable answer, right? They say, God's able to deliver. God's the one in control of our lives. Be it known, O king, even if God chooses not to deliver us physically, that we will still not serve your false God. They give a suitable answer. As God's children, we are often called to be the mouthpiece for God to the lost and even hostile world. 1 Peter 3, 15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with what? With gentleness and respect. So he says, be prepared. Be prepared to speak a word for the Lord. Be prepared by first honoring Christ as the Lord. The idea there is knowing him and, and, and cherishing him, right? Loving him well. And then be prepared by knowing his word. We can't give a good defense if we don't know his word well. But we can also trust him in the moment with our answer. If we yield it to the spirit, if we know our God well, we, we trust him to give us his wisdom in our reply in the moment when we're called upon. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 12, 11 through 12, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. As we've already seen in First Peter, that this promise is not a promise that says, you know what, you don't have to prepare. God's just going to give you the words, right? That's not the point. He says, be prepared, but then trust the Lord to guide your thoughts and your words in that moment to speak a suitable answer a confident answer, a bold answer as well. The Lord gives his people the strength to stand. He even gives the words for them to say when they face opposition. So when your faith is challenged, give a suitable answer. I know the temptation in my own heart. Sometimes I want to stand for the Lord, but the temptation is to not give a suitable answer, right? Not to give a a, a fully truthful answer. Rather, the temptation comes to make an excuse for our faith, right? For our convictions. We don't see these three men giving any excuses, right? 
They, they just share the truth. Sometimes we're tempted to give that secondary reason for our holiness. Sometimes we're like, you know what? I'm not going to go to your party because ah, it's too late for the kids. Or um, I got to work the next day. Or maybe we tell others that, you know what? I, I don't actually participate in that either, you know, sin or I, I, I don't put certain things before my eyes. I don't do that because, you know what? It's, it's just not healthy. Or maybe we might even tell others when they notice your love and your kindness and you're like, well, you know, I just, I just try to generally be a good person, right? I mean, those might be all secondary reasons, but they're not the answer that glorifies God, right? And, and in that, we fail to tell others about God and the true reason that we live the way we do. So a suitable answer is an honest God-honoring answer. It exalts God and his supremacy in our lives. Don't be afraid to tell the lost world why you do what you do, and it's because of who God is and your relationship to him. That's what these men did. They didn't make any excuses. They didn't try to come up with a a way to get out of it. They just told the king honestly. So we want to be bold. We want to trust God. We give a suitable answer, but then we also see that we stand in in our steadfastness. As we stand firm, we must be honorable. We must be honorable. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's answer. Then even in verse 18, he says, But if not, right, if God does not choose to save our physical life, be it known to you, O king, and here's the boldness again, that that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, if you notice, they address the king multiple times as O king, right? They still acknowledged his divine, his position from God that God had given, his position of authority, that God had given. And they are reasonable in their response. They're honorable in their response. They're respectful in their response as well. They don't attack the king. They don't attack their accusers. They make their position clear. And they say, king, it's, it's not because of who you are, but it's because of who our God is that we can't do this, right? So often we want to defend ourselves and so forth, and we start attacking people. They don't do this. They just are clear. They're, they're calm. And I see we see this calm, kind of this bold, gracious rebuke, as well as a calm, bold, gracious declaration of faith. They, they didn't argue with the king. They, they showed the spirit that we were called to have. First Peter 2.17 says this, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor, right? And they were honorable. They couldn't obey him in this point, but they still sought to honor him. In First Peter 3.15, it says that we're always, you know, to be prepared to give a defense, right? We just read that, but it told us how to do it as well with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. We don't have to make a big scene. We don't have to, you know, attack the person. We don't have to get angry. We don't have to, to get our point across. We're just calm, respectful, but bold and confident and truthful. And so as we live in a world that is hostile to our faith, we must first stand firm. That's what we see here, with boldness, with faith in God, giving a clear answer, but doing so in a respectful and honoring way as well. And in this way, God sees, or, or, or the, the world sees our God through us. But we also, in our resolve to stand, and here's our second point, we must expect hostility. They've already faced hostility But you know what? Sometimes as Christians, when we act honorably, when we serve the Lord, too often we believe that God must then protect us from all harm. It's like, God, I'm serving you. I'm serving you. So you should, you know, remove all hardships and trials and pain. And you know what? Sometimes, often he does that. All right? Think of it. Most of us haven't had a trial that has lasted the whole of our lives I mean, there might be some that have lasted a long time, but we've also had times when there's been some ease as well, some joy as well. And if we think about it, this life could have a whole lot more opposition than we face. The Lord has kept us from much opposition as well. So the Lord does shield us from opposition, but he doesn't shield us from all. In fact, in his good plan, he allows opposition to come. And that was God's plan for these three men as well. After all, he, had, he was the one whose hand was in having these men move to Babylon. 
giving them positions of leadership in, in the kingdom, and now having them there on the plain so that they could stand and even face the wrath of the king as well. Verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar, was, he was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was about to give them a second chance, and no more mercy, right? He, he is done. He has just been offended by these men. They have defied his, his authority. And so he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And so here the king is enraged and he, he demands that the furnace is heated to the highest possible temperature, which is somewhat irrational. If he really wanted these men to suffer, he would have lowered the heat. But he's just over-the-top angry. Now, we don't know the exact nature of this furnace. It, it was probably a furnace that was set up for the smelting of, uh, of, of the gold work there, or, or to, for the gold work and maybe the smelting of ore for the gold itself, possibly. It may have even been used as a kiln for the baking of the bricks that may have been used to give stability to that image that was set up. And with the limited description that we have here, as well as from historical studies, it may have been like a large smelting furnace. And these would have had a sizable base uh, where a large fire could be put in um, this, this furnace. And it would have had a smaller opening on the bottom for fueling the fire, perhaps even littler openings for a bellows to really increase the heat. And when it had a large flue that up near the top would be another opening. Um, often these were built against the side of a hill so that that opening could be accessible. And that's where they would smelt the, the, the metal or do the metal work or bake the, the bricks and so forth. And the temperatures in these types of furnaces can reach you know, upwards of 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. These are large and could be very hot furnaces. And so he says, you know what? Stoke that fire, fuel it. If it had bellows, get that as hot as possible, right? And so it is blazing. And the mighty men from his army, they bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 21, then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments. I mean, just all clothed, probably so that they would go up in flames quickly. And they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Verse 22, because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Was it hot? Yes, it was. You had these mighty men, and all they had to do was walk to that opening up near the top, and the flames burnt them, consumed them. Verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. What we see here is men willing to give their lives, to even be burned for the sake of true worship and for the sake of their God. We know the end of the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't. All right? Not yet. In fact, up until this point, we have no indication that they're going to survive. Even their own testimony mentioned that they may indeed die that day. But they didn't back down when opposition came, when their lives were threatened, and even when they were bound and tossed into the fire, they willingly accepted the path God placed them on. See, when we live for the Lord, we must expect hostility from the godless world. Don't be surprised by opposition. And when opposition comes against our faith, we can be sure, though, that our faith is visible. It's an indication that, that the world is seeing our faith as well. And they can see that God is working. See, God does not owe you an easy life. He's not promised his people an easy life. Too often, we believe the lie that says, well, we should have abundant peace if we're serving the Lord. When the exact opposite is often the reality. And now abundant peace and rest, those are promised to us as his children in the life to come. We're going to enter into that rest one day. But for these days, as we, this is not our home. We live in the enemy camp, if you will, serving him as ambassadors here. We may be called to face the persecution and the sufferings that come from a godless world. 
Now, we can pray for peace. In fact, we are told that we should pray for those in authority over us in 2 Timothy 2, 2, and all that are in high positions so that we might lead a peaceable and quiet life, a godly and dignified life in every way. And, and there are, are times when God blesses that. We can live that peaceable way. We can pray for that. But we also understand that from his good hand, God often will send opposition for his name's sake. So resolve to stand. Expect hostility from a godless world. But as you do that, don't forget to watch God work. There's our third point. Watch God work. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fall into the flames. They land on the the pile of burning fuel, the red-hot embers. And Nebuchadnezzar, if it is one of those that I mentioned there, would have had a, a smaller opening near the bottom for fuel. And, and he is watching. He can see into this furnace, and he's looking. Verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he rose up in haste, and he, j- he jumps out of his seat, and he declares to his counselors, now not everybody could see into the furnace, and he's like, did we not cast three men into the, bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. Verse 25, he answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. The fire had consumed the strong men that had thrown them in. It had consumed the ropes that bound these men, but now they're safe walking around in the fire. They weren't trying to escape. They are just simply walking around in the fire. But they were not alone. And and Nebuchadnezzar describes this fourth individual who is like a son of the gods, uh, one of divine origin. Your translation may read uh, like the son of God. The Aramaic here for God is plural and could be either rendered gods or if it is the divine plural, you know, suggesting the one true God. Either way, we see Nebuchadnezzar, he's trying to describe something that he couldn't describe in human terms. It wasn't another person. This being was like a divine being. In fact, later, Nebuchadnezzar actually describes it as an angel later on in his praise to God. Now, who was that fourth person? Well, two possibilities. Either it was simply an angel sent by God to protect these men, or it was God himself. Specifically, as the Old Testament described, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus, the angel of the Lord, there in that fire with his people. And I believe that there's good reason to think that this one indeed was God himself there with those men in the midst. But whether it was Jesus or one of his angels, the important point here was God was with them. God was protecting them, right? He, he had chosen to deliver these men physically from the flames. Perhaps the words of Isaiah 43, too, were ringing in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's ears that says, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. These men experienced the deliverance of God that day. They saw his hand work mightily on their behalf. See, when we resolve to stand in the face of opposition, when we resolve to stand for God, we will also see him work. We're not told all the reasons why we are called to face opposition and suffering in this life. But we are told some of those reasons. One is simply for the strengthening of our own faith. Believe me, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of that fire here in a few moments with stronger faith, right? Right? In 1 Peter 1, 6-7, it says, In this you rejoice, that now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. And he's talking there about persecutions even for the faith. He says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right? Now, the, that, those fiery trials might not be literal. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego it was. But we see that God does a refining work in the life of his people through those sufferings. But Paul also had a good perspective on the sufferings that he experienced for the sake of the gospel. Because not only does the suffering and the opposition come to God's people to refine us, but it is so that fellow believers are strengthened and the gospel is advanced. 
In Philippians 1, 12 through 14, Paul was writing to the Philippian believers and, and he was in prison at this time. And he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He says, this was good. Yeah, the suffering I experienced It's advancing the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. But he also says, and most of the brothers, he's talking about his fellow believers there, he says, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he says, I have suffered, I have faced opposition from the world, and God has worked the gospel advancement through it, and he's also strengthened the boldness of God's people. It was worth suffering. So our faith can be strengthened through these trials, but so can others. In fact, the testimony we have of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego still strengthen our faith today, does it not? So when you're called to suffer for righteousness' sake, it may be for the benefit of others' faith. And all of this, though, when we're called to suffer, the supreme reason is so that God would be glorified, that God would be seen as he was here. God's power and his grace to a lost world. Look at Nebuchadnezzar, verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar came near the door of the burning fiery furnace and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. Now just as a quick side note, these men's accusers had claimed that these men paid no attention to the king, right? They said, you don't don't honor the king. But they've always obeyed the king as far as they could until he told them to worship someone else. In fact, they even waited for the king's command to exit the fire. They're just walking around the fire, right? They could have just come out any, any time, right? Waited for the king's command. Verse 27. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors, they hadn't been able to see what was happening in the furnace. They gather together and they saw that the fire had, had, had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. And so the power of God could not be denied. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, who is the God who will, remember Nebuchadnezzar's boast, he said, who is the God who will deliver you? And now it's a very clear message from God. It's the true God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And this was astonishing. So verse 28 Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him, and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. So why were these three men called by God to endure hostility, opposition, temptation, trials, and fire? It was so that the king... And the watching world would see and glorify God. Nebuchadnezzar, he he was astonished by God's power and rescue that day. So verse 29, he says, Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. I think what we see here is one, Nebuchadnezzar is, is, is fearful. He had just challenged God, right? Who is the God who can deliver? And God responds with this mighty display, and so he's, we're not going there and again. Nobody in the nation defies the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's not a full confession of faith yet. Not yet. Not for Nebuchadnezzar. We're seeing little hints even through all these opening chapters of Daniel of God's grace towards Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan king, showing him a little bit more, a little bit more of who he is. And we'll see that more as we jump into the next chapter next week. But at least he's seen and acknowledged God's power and his ability to rescue. And so the king, he's astonished by God's hand of deliverance. But look what he praises God for. It's for the steadfastness of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was their testimony that moved his heart. 
Because back in verse 28, he said, they, they were those who trusted in God. They set aside the king's command. They yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own. It was their devotion. It was their sacrifice. It was their faith. It was their witness to, to the truthfulness and the power of God that declared to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon who God was. Our bodies our lives, our conduct, they're the Lord's. They're not ultimately ours. We've been bought with a price. Glorify God in your body. Right? Romans 6, 13. Don't present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who've been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Romans 12.1 talks about living as that, that living sacrifice to God. All we think, all we say, all we do, yield it to him, yield it to his service. So when we're steadfast for the Lord in this world, the world sees that. And among the other reasons God has us to face opposition, trials of our faith, there is this purpose of bringing glory to God. God. And when the world sees your faithfulness, when the world sees the Lord being faithful to you through the difficulties and hardships, when they see his strength, when they see his comfort, when they see his wisdom, when they see his faithfulness in you, some will glorify him, acknowledge him, come to him. As we stand back and watch God work through the sufferings, we're promised that he will exalt us. We will be blessed for our faithfulness. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the last verse of this chapter says, then the king promoted them, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the province of Babylon. They get a higher position, right? Now, they were promoted in the world's eyes. We may or may not be promoted in the world's eyes for our stand, all right? That's not a promise here for us, but we do see God will exalt those who serve him. Matthew 5, 11 through 12 says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. Falsely in my account, rejoice and be glad. Why? Your reward is great in heaven. So when we watch God work, we know that our future is secure that our eternal home is secure, and that the Lord will rescue and deliver us. Who was the greatest example of facing persecution and sufferings in this world? Jesus. Was he delivered from death? Well, he died, right? But then he rose again, right? See, Jesus came to earth and he took our place of judgment you know, we, we, we are sinners and we face that just judgment of the holy God and eternity separated from him. But Jesus, God, the Son, fully God, fully man, willingly came to earth and he suffered opposition and he even went and suffered death so that we could be saved. In 1 Peter 2.23, we read that when he was reviled, what did he do? He did not revile in return. When he suffered... He did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly, to God the Father. And Jesus suffered opposition. He suffered death so that we could have life. Was Jesus delivered? Yes. He died, but he also rose from the dead three days later, and he lives forever. God the Father has what highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, right? So that all would bow bow before him. He is Lord and Savior. He's the one who gives eternal life. He's the one who gives forgiveness to all who repent and believe on him. And if you're not a child of God this morning, I hope you've seen God clearer in this passage. If you're not forgiven by him, today is the day of salvation. He is the God of salvation. He he can deliver from the fire, but more importantly, he can deliver you from the eternal judgment to come. Look to Jesus. Repent of your sins. Believe on Jesus as Lord and Savior. He'll save you, forgive you, reconcile you, give you his righteousness and eternal life. God is a God of salvation. So God's mighty hand is often seen through the sufferings of his people. 
It was seen through Jesus. It was seen through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because when we suffer for his sake, we get a, a front row seat to watch him work. These three men did. They saw God work. Jim Elliot and his four friends did as well, right? And others that followed. Did God deliver Jim Elliot and his four friends that day from their attackers? Well, they weren't saved in the same way or delivered in the same way that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, right? For they died that day. But God did deliver them safely home. And he also delivered them that day from fear and from compromise. He delivered them from the idols of comfort and security and selfishness. He delivered them from cowardice and unbelief as they stood firm for their faith when they face opposition. And they watched God bring them safely into his presence. And the result of that has been uh, decades now of watching God use their testimony and their boldness to reach a people that once had not known the Savior so that many would come to salvation even through their witness. God was working. So these are the testimonies, these these vivid pictures of the mighty hand of God as he glorifies his name, as he impacts the world, even through the sufferings, the faithful, standing firm, steadfastness of his people. So resolve to stand in this godless world. Be bold, stand firm, watch God work. Let's pray. Father, We thank you for your word and the example that we have in it of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Lord, I know from their words that they would say quite quickly, it's not about us. It was about your power, your salvation, your deliverance. Lord, I pray as we live in a world that is opposed to you, a godless world, Lord, that we wouldn't be surprised when sufferings come. But Lord, when you call us to walk through sufferings and persecutions for our faith, Lord, I pray that we would stand, that we'd see you work, and that the world would see you work, that you would be glorified. We pray for that strength. We thank you for that strength that you supply. In Christ's name, amen.